specifically my subcaption, if this works, is that um, basically I want you to maximize your students and your program. So I want to come up with some strategies and ways that we can approach that. Um, and the way I want to look at this is twofold. When I started thinking about the meat of today, that was kind of easy for me. It's like, okay, let's talk about engagement in the classroom and all that. That kind of worked itself out. But then I started thinking, okay, well, how do we start it? And what's the real, you know, what's the, the philosophy behind creating good students? And so the more I thought about it, the more this amazing um, philosopher of our time came to mind um, as I was doing this, and it was Cesar Milan. And so he has <laughs> nothing to do with this. Um, he has, I'm not, you know, supporting anything. I'm not promoting anything. But anytime I used to watch that show, he would always tell the people, your dog's a mess, everything's a mess, but we have to change you first. And it was always the same approach. And the people would come to him because my dog's horrible. And he was like, no, your dog's a dog. You're horrible. <laughs> right? So that's the kind of the, where my mindset kept going on this. It's like we complain about our students or like our programs, this and that. And then I realized, well, for the last thousand years, it's been the same kid walking in the building every year. So let's figure out what, what really can be um, affected to create change. And so his thing is, let's change their behavior by changing ours. So that's my, the first approach I wanna take as we kind of look at this. So as I said before, I feel like all the kids come in the room with the same needs and desires, right? They need to be accepted. They need to know they're important. They need to be safe. Um, they need to be challenged. They need to be in a, an environment that's structured and has rules. And even the things they don't know they need, they need. And they, I feel like they all need this. Like it's an inherent human thing that that's what we need. The problem is the environment is what throws everything off. So that's what I feel like we can control. We can't control the human needs, but we can control the environment that's either providing or not providing those needs. And when I think of the environment, I think of me. Like this is either my achievement or my fault. And so that's the first thing I wanna kinda of look at is we're gonna look at ourselves. The problem with the leaders, I'm sorry, the students, I think stop, start, stop with their leaders. So you're walking your dog, you're really tense, you're pulling on the leash, like everything's, the dog's gonna feel that as he would say. And he's like, look, if you're gonna walk your dog, you have to relax. You have to hold the leash a certain way. You have to just be confident. Like, and then the dog would feed off of that. Well, to me, it's the same way with the students. If they walk in the room and you're uptight and everything's wrong and this and that, and other, like that's what they're going to be. And so we're gonna create whatever students come from how we act. So first question is, who is their leader? Us. And then what can we do about that? Well, let's look at some things. I truly feel like they are a very realistic reflection of who we are. And so when we're looking at our kids or our program, we're, we should be looking in the mirror because they're literally just reacting to what we are. And so with that in mind, there's some things that I've done and that I hear people do that kind of bother me that I think we need to kind of look at for a second. Number one, um, you know, you're having a conversation with somebody and you catch yourself like, man, these kids are so rude, these kids nowadays do this, these kids don't care, these kids do this. Like, we just bad mouth our kids. And I started thinking, well, hold on. If they're a reflection of me and I'm bad mouthing them, then I'm really just telling you my problem. Like, this is where I'm failing, is what I'm saying to you. I'm not telling you that this is what they're doing wrong. I'm telling you what I'm doing wrong. And so, I start catching myself when I want to say those things. Now it's like, okay, stop. What am I doing that's causing me to want to say those things? So that's the first thing I kind of, it catches me. Number two is, do I have standards and expectations? Do they know what's expected? Do they know how to act? Do they know like, when I jump on them, am I jumping on them and they're like, why is he yelling at us? I don't even know what's wrong. Or am I getting on them and they're like, you're right, you've already told us a thousand times to do this and we're not doing it. So I can't get on them if I haven't even told them what I expect of them, okay? So did I put those standards and expectations in place? What's my attitude look like when I come in the room and when I come in the building? What am I carrying with me, okay? Where's my moral compass pointing? 
right? Where, like if I have problems with the way the kids are talking, how am I talking? Are they catching me in my office saying things? Like, like those kind of questions, um, because as you all know, they know everything we do. And we may think I'm talking in private, and there is no privacy in the school. Like it doesn't exist. How am I interacting with my peers, right? The rest of the school, the principal. How am I interacting with the other directors in front of the kids? Okay, how am I interacting with the parents that work with us? How am I interacting when we go to another contest or a football game? Like, what am I showing my students? Because if I'm gonna tell them, hey, we're not competitive driven, you need to celebrate everyone's successes, and then I'm over there with the directors complaining about the judging that we should have beat so-and-so. Like, that, that's what they're going to do because they're a reflection. And then, et cetera. This is, you just use, Whatever you come up with, as we're talking about this, whatever pops into your head, that's the et cetera. Okay, so I think this idea of reflection is really important. So once we get ourselves straight, then we can talk about the students. And until that happens, our expectations for them need to not exist. Because I think our expectations for ourselves must come first before anything can happen. So how do we do this? All right, this is a hard one, especially for me early on in, in my career. And that was the idea of not reflection, but honest reflection. Because we're all told to reflect. Like, reflect on what happened. Okay, okay, good, I got it. No, it's like honest reflection. Like, I'm gonna look in the mirror and I'm actually going to pay attention to either what I think of myself, or more importantly, what other people think of myself. So, experienced teachers, I don't know what year this is. Okay, I don't know where this line's drawn, but I know I've fallen into this trap. And that is the idea of, I've done this long enough, so my reflection is, I, I'm, too, I'm too old to change, right? I've been doing this, I've been doing that. It's like, no, we did really well last year, right? Hey, I wrote a book, I don't need to reflect. Like, we kind of get caught in these mindsets, right? So the question I have been is, why did we get caught in this mindset? So I started asking myself these questions, like what could it be? Am I just lazy? Am I tired, which to me, lazy and tired are not even remotely the same thing. Am I just stubborn? Because like, I feel like I've drawn a line in the sand and this is where I'm gonna stay. Like, this is who I am. Is it because I've been successful? Hey, we've had the last couple of years have been really good. I'm not changing anything. There's no reason to, we're successful. Or am I scared? Like, you know, when this whole electronic thing exploded and some of us did not grow up with all that, it was moving faster than for me, all the other parts of my percussion education. And luckily, percussionists were stuck with all of that. And we're really appreciative of that, by the way. Um, so, we had to keep up with all of that. So the idea is I can either try to like pretend it doesn't exist, or I can just jump in there and try to figure it out. And so sometimes the older we get, it can get actually more scary because we get farther away from what's new. And I think that's a legitimate concern. For newer teachers, I think reflection can be hard because they just don't have the skills. Like, I've been doing this for a year, what am I gonna reflect on? I still don't even know what day of the week it is, right? Or, I don't have enough experience to be effective at it because the things that failed, maybe they were the right things to do, but I need time to figure out how to do them better. So I think for newer teachers, reflection can be difficult just because of the experience and the age factor. So with that in mind, this should not be you alone doing this, okay? Reflection we always think of as a very solo, intimate act, and I don't think that's actually the best way to approach it because we can lie to ourselves easier than anyone else on the planet, right? I mean, that's, that's a very simple task for a lot of us because for some people it's a survival mechanism. I mean, it's just sometimes we have to lie to ourselves. So I need to find out from other people how things are going. What do you see that I'm doing? What do you think? What This happened. What did you notice that I did? So that can be a very powerful tool because your staff is watching, right? Just like everybody, everyone's watching you. And if you're in a position where you have any type of authority, everyone's watching. And a lot of times watching comes with judging. Everyone has an opinion about how you're doing. And so that's not a bad thing always. Another thing is what do the students see? which can be terrifying, okay? So I started this thing quite a while ago with my students at the high school. 
where about three times a year, grab a piece of paper, grab a pencil, spread out around the band hall. I'm gonna write some questions on the board. You do not have to put your name on this paper. This is completely anonymous. The only time you put your name on the paper is if there's something that we need to have a conversation about and you want me to know it's you. Besides that, no names. And I will ask questions like marching band season just ended. What did you think about this? Okay. What did you like about this season? What did you not like? Okay. What could I have done better to set you, set you up for success this marching band season? What did you think of your section leader? All these kind of open-ended questions and everyone from freshman to senior gets the same questions and the same opportunity. And I can tell you this has been pretty eye-opening at times. And I'll get them all, and then at some point I'll go sit on my own and read them. And I've had years where I'll read you know, something, because I always put at the end, what do you want Mr. Chapel to know? And I'll see kids like grab more paper, and they're typing, and it's like, oh boy. So, and I'll have, like I've had a kid one year that said, you don't know this, but my home life completely fell apart this summer. And if it wasn't for you in this program, I don't know if I would be alive right now. You read that, it's like, that, like, that makes you feel like I'm in the right place and no matter what else I'm doing, everything's okay. And then in the same day, I'll get, you're the worst teacher I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Everything you do sucks and all the kids hate you because you're so mean and demand. And it's like, okay, so I, there's, you asked for it. But it's really powerful to know what they think, especially when they know they don't have to tell you who they are. And if you're okay reading that, then I think you would be surprised at what kind of answers you get. Another thing about honest reflection is we need to drop the attitude. Okay? If you want honest, then you be ready for honest. Because it's not confrontational. It's therapeutic. It's actually really helpful. And if you can tell your staff, hey, we're going to talk about some stuff that went on this fall, and I want you to give me your honest answers. If you're defending yourself every time they say something, you're not doing honest reflection. You're just arguing. This is really hard to do. Like, I've been married twice, so I know. Like, when you ask someone for their honest opinion, it can get really tough. But if you know that the person you're talking to is doing it from the right point of view, then it's actually really powerful. But you have to come into it with the right mindset, okay? Another thing, especially, I think, for, for younger or people that are in tough situations, it's easy for us to find programs. Like I can think of 10 programs right now that I look at like, holy cow, that, that is amazing what they're doing. But that program may not have anything to do with your situation. So I think the biggest thing is find the similar situations to you. Find the people in those situations are doing things that you respect, that are farther along with you, that maybe have had different or better results than you. Then from there, go to them and take everything they're doing and try it. Because you can go, let's see, who won UIL 6A State Marching? I'm gonna go find out what they're doing. Well, if your kids are like working three jobs and babysitting their little brother and sister in the morning because their mom's on their third job of the night, that, that may not be the exact same correlation. Like, I think you have to understand exactly what you have and then who has the same thing and start there, if that makes sense. Because I think all of us tend to look to the same people sometimes, and it's not always relevant. What is your ideal program? I think this is something you have to decide before all of this. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the kids yet. This is still us talking. So there are no wrong answers to this. So I threw up just some ideas of an ideal program. There's nothing wrong with competition. It's just how you treat it that makes it good or bad. So if you want to be a competitive program and that kind of drives you, great. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's healthy. You want the kids to have a great time. You want them to love walking in your building because it's always fun and we're always having a good time and we're doing music, but we're doing music as an avenue to have a great environment where the kids enjoy being there. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Jack of all trades. You want to do jazz band, but not have the best jazz band in the world. You want to do marching band, you, you want to do everything and give them a chance to experience all the different factors of what music can bring to them, but you're not focused on one thing that has to be the best of, of everything else. I think that's healthy. I think just having a place where the kids know they're safe and have a reason to come to school, free from bullying, free from judgment, free from, I don't have to worry about home right now. Free, I think that's incredibly important. And I think that's more than a legitimate ideal program to have. Again, it's all about the situation. And, and you think of your strengths and then that's what your program and your situation, and that's how they marry each other. And then of course, fill in the blank. I, I know I'm missing something, okay? So I have to decide that first. And then I establish my goals to reach that program. So my goals, they need to basically be established to be relevant to the program, and I'm putting them in to improve what's happening, and that way I'm not just randomly going day by day by day trying to get somewhere. Like if I know where I want to be and then I set the goals, then every day is a step in the right direction. And I think that's super important. Long-term goals, short-term goals, um, they're not the same obviously, but they're both equally important. So these goals, in my opinion, provide you and the students a tangible sense of direction. The students have to know these, by the way. No goals should be hidden, in my opinion. They have to know what the goals are. Because to create momentum, you need times of success. And then if you have a short-term goal and you need it, every kid knows we did something. And now we're ready to push to the next goal and to the next goal. And you build this momentum and it's tangible. It's not just out there philosophical talk. It's actually, I can see what's happening. I will say though, when you establish goals, I feel like if you try to establish a goal that's beyond your control, you are setting yourselves up for failure. I don't think any goal should ever involve something that you and the students can't directly control. We're gonna have 12 all staters this year. We had 11. It was the best year the school's ever seen, but technically you're failures. Like that doesn't make sense to me. We're gonna go win that contest. Well, what if you don't win it? Are we now failures? Like, I think you really need to be careful of, can we control the goal or not? If the answer is no, it's not a goal. They have to be relevant to your program. Every kid is gonna pass their classes this first semester. That may not be your school. For some schools, that may be the hardest thing they've had to do yet, okay? It has to be relevant. It has to be applicable to those kids or they're not gonna see the benefit and so they're not gonna work with you. And then let them have a voice. They don't have to run the program, but if you ask them, hey, what are some goals for this semester? I think we should all pass our classes. Thank you, like, and don't think you told that person to say that, even if you didn't, right? So giving them a voice will give them ownership. And as soon as they have ownership, you can step back and just watch it happen. Because that means this is their program now, not just yours. You're not telling them what to do. So I just came up with some random inside the classroom goals. These are the things that happen within your walls. And again, these are not the end all list. I just threw some together. Some of them inclusive, effective time management, academics. There's nothing to do with playing music. But then of course, some of them like, yeah, I'd love it if we all played in time. Boy, wouldn't that help? Um, so there are some really nice music based goals, but I think there has to be non music based goals. Because I'm guessing the percentage of your students that graduate and become music majors is probably less than 5%, 3%, 2%. I mean, I don't, personally don't think we're here to make music majors. I personally think we're here to use music to create productive citizens. That's just kind of how I look at it. So all my goals can't be music based. Outside the classroom, well, all of our programs exist outside the school more than probably any program on campus. So, what's our culture gonna look like? How's our standards gonna play out? Okay, are we gonna have pride in what we do? Or are we gonna sit around and complain about ourselves in front of other schools? Um, so just all the kind of things that you can kind of put in that affect outside the classroom, just as important as inside. And I think separating them also allows the students to kind of see the difference. So, here we go. Now we're talking students. How did we get there? This was 
something that came out on the internet a while back. A lot of you have probably seen this. Um, I loved it as soon as I saw it. The idea of this, you jump in this wheel, and once you're in it, we just keep it going. So I kind of took that idea, but I wanted to switch it up a little bit. And instead of looking at it that way, I looked at it this way. So engagement or involvement or improvement. Like that, that's kind of the buzzwords I use to kind of show the exact same concept, okay? And so then I want to take each part of these and see how, how we can implement them. And then you may have a kid that jumps on at an involvement, because like, I want to be involved with a group somewhere. You may have a kid that jumps in on improvement because I just want to be good at playing my instrument. Like, it doesn't matter where you pull them in. Once they're in the wheel, they're in there. Like, if you see a hamster get in, it doesn't matter where they jumped in. They're flying around in circles now, and it doesn't matter where it started. So, these are three areas, but it doesn't matter which one you get in. I think, logically, this is the approach, but when does logic ever dictate how our kids think? So, um, it doesn't have to be in this order. Okay, so engagement leads to involvement, it leads to improvement. So, there's kind of the, the catchphrase for this first little bullet point. Engagement equals fun. That's kind of the, the throwback to the original circle that I saw. So the first thing we have to do, again, the environment. We have to create the right environment. We're not creating the kid, we're creating the environment. And you're gonna see this almost every time we talk about something. It takes a village. There's no way you can do all this on your own. There's no way, and you shouldn't have to. Like, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Even if you're the only director at your school, there are ways to bring in other people to help you with this. So, use all the people at your disposal. They may not even live in your city, but you can still use them, um, whether it's through YouTube or Skyping or flying them in or email, it doesn't matter. Find the strengths that balance your weaknesses. Okay, a good example of this is um, when my head director, Mark, and I would teach the jazz band, co-teach it early on, like 12, 15 years ago, um, we had all played in jazz band in high school. None of us had a jazz degree. None, if I listed what are my strengths and weaknesses, jazz band would not be at the top. But we knew enough to get the kids to enjoy it and be able to put on concerts, etc. But we knew that wasn't our strength. Well, at the time, we had a lady teaching in our feeder pattern whose husband was a jazz person. Phenomenal jazz person. And so we went to him and said, hey, would you be willing to come out? He's like, sure, we're in rehearsals. Well, this day, they say, okay, I'll come to all of them. We didn't pay him. He came to every rehearsal because he had time. And we were, oh, we kind of like stepped back and just kind of watched him. Okay, well, after a few years, he got a job at Carroll High School. And I think he's on his sixth or fifth invite to essentially Ellington, right? They found out yesterday, John, I think. Um, phenomenal. So we obviously lucked into probably one of the best jazz educators I've ever seen in my life. But we searched for him, found him, and said, hey, we'd love for you to come in here. Sure. And he came in and just started teaching our jazz band. So we could have said, like, I got this. Like, we don't need any help. We did need help. And so we were willing to admit that and go find someone better than us. And it helped me because I learned a lot from him. Another thing, your program from beginners through seniors, if it's not connected and working together, it's broken. It is broken. I don't care how successful a certain part of your program is. If you are not on the same page from day one to day last with every director and every person going through that program, it's not functioning correctly. I truly believe that. And that's a whole other talk in itself. But I just wanted to put that out there as we continue to look at all this. So here is, I'm walking into two of our middle schools one day and so I just took random pictures. On the left, Indian Springs Middle School, those are the banners we used at Macy's that they have just set up. So you walk in there and you automatically know that you're part of a bigger picture. You're in the Keller family. Like I'm not just in Indian Springs, which in and itself is an amazing honor anyway. But I'm also part of a program. You walk into Keller Middle School, on the back wall of the band hall, it says Keller Band. And above it, those are all pictures, random pictures of the band, uh, Keller High School band program, whether at a band contest or the stands at a football game or whatever. So those kids walk in, they are part of Keller Middle School, which is a great honor for them. 
but at the same time they know I'm part of something way bigger than just this school. And if you want to talk about recruiting, this is the easiest way to do it. Because these kids from sixth grade on already see themselves in your high school band program, just so you know. So there's no question about am I staying in band, it's I can't wait to get to high school band. With that in mind, the all-in factor. If they feel accepted and welcomed for who they are, which as we all know today, that takes on a whole new meaning than it did 20 years ago. Like this is probably moving faster than anything else in my career, is this statement. And if you create a place where that's happening, because it's not happening in most of the other places they walk around during their normal school day, they will then give you 100%. If you say who you are is perfect for our program, then they're going to give you everything they have. Extremely important. So another environmental thing for me is creating all in. Power of conformity. This study, um, and I've actually talked about this in other talks as well, but when I first read it, it just blew my mind. So I always go back to it. Solomon Ash in 1951 did this study about the power of conformity. They wanted to kind of see how powerful is peer pressure, because we always talk about it, but it's not really data-driven for the most part. So here's what he did. He did an experiment, and he lined up groups of eight people, eight teenagers, and in 12 of the 18 trials, the first seven teenagers all knew what they were going to answer, and it was going to be wrong. The eighth teenager had no idea that they were in an experiment, and what they asked them was, what is the last line most similar to. Okay, you look at that and it's like, really? Like that's the experiment? So seven people would say C, and then we get to number eight, and they got an answer. Okay, so let's see what the results were. And that's that's what I just told you. He also did some where there was only one person that they asked. 75% of them conformed at least one time of saying it was C. Even though they knew without a shadow of a doubt the answer was not C or not B or whatever the right answer was, they knew it, but they did not say it because they did not want to stand out or they thought the group knew way more than they did. 25% never conformed. Then the same people, less than 1% conformed when asked by themselves what's the answer. That to me is... That's pretty powerful. And as a parent, that's pretty scary. Because when we think of peer pressure, it's never a good thing. Drunk driving, drugs, sex, like you name it. That, as a parent, that's what keeps you up at night when you think of peer pressure. But then the question was, but can it be used for good? Like what if the peer pressure in your program was to go practice? What if it was to show up with your doc book? What if it was to have your measures numbered? What if that was peer pressure in your program? Conformity doesn't say I'm bad. It just says I am what I am. Now how you choose to use it is up to you. So that's my thought of how can we flip this, okay? Again, establish positive traditions. If all your traditions are positive, then everyone's gonna get in line because all the other people are doing the traditions. If they're not positive, then you immediately walk in and say, hey, remember that thing you guys were doing? Yeah, we're done with that. And then you move on. Like, tradition should never be a concern for you. I don't care if it's year one or 20 for you. If you show them and say, we always did that. Okay, I appreciate that. Well, now we don't. It's <laughs> worth it. Because A, those kids are graduating anyway. And B, they're going to complain for a week, and then they're going to go on with their lives. Okay? So that's the first thing for me is... Fix the traditions. Number two, decide on your culture. Like, what's your culture going to be of your program? And make it positive. Your brand, in my opinion, is basically your culture that people can see. So for me, our culture or our brand is literally Keller Drumline. That's it. That's all we are. But the idea was, I'm going to give you so many ways to wear your brand, so many ways to show the school that... I am part of this culture. And so if I'm willing to walk through the schools of a high school and advertise that I'm in the Keller Drumline, I'm in the band, 
then I have no shame. I, I'm not ashamed of that fact. Everyone knows it. And so that pride through ownership to me is really powerful. Because you're creating a culture where the kids want to belong. And they want to show you this is who I am. And now, and Color Guard and Drumline have been ahead of the other parts of the band for a long time in this area, I feel like. But now you'll see Keller Woodwinds, Keller Hornline. Like you'll now see it spreading into the rest of the band. And I think the more you give them ways to wear that, then the more they're gonna go out there and show everyone that they care about their program. Another thing about the environment. Did I lose you? You got me? Okay. Is you have to establish these standards of excellence or high expectations. And then you have to remind them every day that these are our standards. The standards, again, are not floating up in some philosophical cloud. They're happening right in front of your face. So some of those could be, how do we treat our equipment? Like if I walk into part of our band hall and I see a marimba uncovered, well then, then as soon as we have class, I'll go, all right, everybody walk in that room and tell me if that room looks excellent to you. And then they'll walk back out. I'm like, what's wrong? The marimba's not covered. Okay, well then you need to go solve that because that's not how we operate. Like, I didn't ask them to go fix it. I made it a big point. Like, I told them, that's not our standard. So I like to do a thing like the conformity idea is if we create a, a really solid set of standards, if you're living outside the standard in the program, you're uncomfortable. You don't feel good being there because you're not practicing or because you're not covering your instruments or because, you, like, whatever that thing is, if you're not following it, you're now the awkward one, not the one that's fitting in. And those kids have two options, fit in, or they're gonna have to go find somewhere where they fit in better, which we prefer them not do, but we can't also like bend the rule to make sure they feel comfortable. No, 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 the standard is stronger than you. Okay, and at 99.9% of the time, it works, because they all want that structure. How do we speak in public? How do we get off the bus? How are we gonna rehearse? Like, all these things can be discussed. Because I tell my kids, once I've taught you something, I now can yell at you about it. And that's a deal we have. If I told you that you're gonna get off the bus in full uniform and hold your hat this way, and you choose not to, we're gonna have a conversation. Because you chose not to do it right. I'm not choosing to get mad at you. You're, it's your fault, you're making me mad at you. But if I don't teach them these things, I can't get mad at them. Because that's not me setting the standard ahead of time. All right, so that's engagement. Now we go to involvement. So if you flip the wheel, involvement, improvement, engagement. So now we just flip the wheel again to go to the next section. And this is what I call the work side, okay? The first question for hard work is, what gets rewarded in your program? And the reason I'm asking is because when I first got to my current school, if you were a junior or senior, you were basically given whatever you wanted. So when I got there, it's like, okay, I'm gonna start with the current seventh and eighth graders, and I'm gonna get them ready so when they walk into the high school, the older kids aren't gonna know what just happened to them. So the first time those kids showed up as freshmen, and they're playing on the same level or better than the older kids, that flips everything upside down. Because then I say, well, no, you didn't make the scenario line because like those three kids played everything they were asked to and you didn't know the exercises. Yeah, but I'm a senior. It's like, well, okay, well, congratulations that you've passed all three years so far in high school. That doesn't mean you have to be in the scenario line. Like you have to do the work and you have to re be rewarded by earning the spot. You are earning it, not because you got a year older, but because you did what it takes. And as soon as that happened once, everything changed. Now I have seniors who are actually going out to buy mallets so they can practice after school because they never had anything because they didn't have to do anything. So as soon as that happens and you can back it up, it changes everything. And so now, if you earn a spot, you get the spot. There is no confusion there. And that, that was a long time ago, so now the, the kids there don't even know that that wasn't a thing. So for me, hard work creates rewards. That doesn't always mean talent either, right? It can be attitude, it can be attendance, it can be a lot of things. You can be really talented and if you're not showing up, like what, what's the point? So a lot of times we tend to make talent the only requirement 
And I think that can be a little sketchy at times. When we talk about hard work, your program has to be stronger than your students. Because I hear people talk to me sometimes like, oh, I've got this first chair flute that, you know, she's got the solos, and, but she doesn't ever want to come to band, and I don't know what to do. And every, it's like, I do. Send her. Like, either say, you got to come to band or you're not in band anymore. It's pretty simple. Because the next person is probably going to take this opportunity to step up and fill that role. Like, you're creating chances for kids to be rewarded for hard work, for stepping up. You have to create that, and you have to live by it, or it means nothing. You can never let a kid hold your program hostage, because they're graduating anyway. Like, you're not hiring them for the next 10 years to play first flute. They're leaving anyway, so it doesn't matter. The next kid has to be ready. So to me, you take advantage of that. Now, do we want that to happen? Of course not. But it's not something that should stop your program. I think that's something that, you, especially in a smaller program, I can, I understand when you when people say, "Well, I got four flutes." I understand that. Do you want four flutes where three don't care and one's not showing up, or three flutes that all care and are busting themselves to be the best they can be? Like, because that one flute's leaving anyway. It's kind of how I would look at it. The next thing for hard work, I just can't yell work hard. It doesn't work. It's like yelling playing time and then running it again. Like it doesn't work. I have to give them opportunities and reasons to either apply their work ethic or to find it. Like some kids don't even know what a work, their work ethic is. So I gotta allow them to find out what hard work means. Okay? And I do that by doing my job first. I'm creating the expectations, I'm creating a calendar that allows opportunity for hard work. I'm re-auditioning. We had a marching band drum line. Well, indoor is a whole new thing. We're re-auditioning. Because if not, then that one kid who didn't make it has an entire year of doing what? Nothing. There's no hope. So it's no, we're re-auditioning in December. We're going to re-audition for something in January. We're going to re like whatever that is. So there's always a chance for their hard work to pay off. You can't make them wait or they won't do it. Our leadership team has grown immensely since I first started there, and it's been wonderful. Because the concept is the kid that is willing to step in front of their section and rehearse something and be confident is not the same kid who's willing to go reorganize your music library in a way that you never thought was possible and you were willing to pay 10 grand for it. Right? And they're not the same kid. And so if I'm only expecting my kids to be leaders who will stand in front of everybody and talk, I'm missing out on 90% of incredibly smart, talented kids. I've got people, quartermaster, they're not necessarily going to leave, and I definitely don't want them touching my music library, but if I say move that car over there, it's moved. <laughs> right? We have those kids. Give them a chance to work hard for you. You've got the kids that are real happy-go-lucky that want to like include everybody and come up with things. Okay, plan a party for the incoming freshmen. Your public relations, go knock that out. Like You've got to create chances for every student, if they want to, to work hard and be a part of what's going on. Next thing, um, these are just random opportunities throughout the year. We don't have to go into all these, they're self-explanatory, but these are just some things I thought of that we use um, at different times just to give kids a chance to kind of jump in and take responsibility and like, I may have three or four freshmen that want to set up for the middle school concert after school. It's like, okay, you guys went to school there, your little brother's gonna be playing, or little sister, so you go take care of that. That gives them a chance to show responsibility to do something and it's nothing, it's not that huge risk reward thing. If they didn't set up correctly when I'm there, I just help them, it's no big deal. But at least it's giving them chances to do that. Daily involvement. This one, um, this one's more of a percussion thing at times because those of you are who are percussionists know, you know, in concert band setting, it's nothing wrong if I don't play the first 45 minutes of class. It's we're used to it. It's no big deal. But the idea is, besides just percussion, how can you keep all the kids involved? Well, for percussion, it could be, hey, take these three pages out of your curriculum, get on your pad, go in the other room, and then tomorrow you're going to play these for me while we warm up. 
Or it could be, here's a percussion ensemble, go learn it. Or, hey, I'm working with the woodwinds today. Trumpets, here's, I want you guys to go work on this and you're gonna pass, it, you're gonna play it for the rest of the class at the end of class. And it's like an A bar thing. And it's like, you are gonna come play it for us, so be ready. Well, there's peer pressure. They don't wanna play in front of their friends and, and look foolish. So you're coming up with a way to keep them involved, even if that day your lesson plan doesn't involve them. You still have to have ways to keep them going. And I think the more you think outside the box on that, the quicker you'll come up with all kinds of stuff. Um, jazz band, we take everybody. I don't care what you're playing. We're gonna figure out how to get you in jazz band. And if we have 40 kids that wear new jazz band, then we'll have the top jazz band will be legit set up. The bottom jazz band may have a bassoon in it. We'll figure it out. It doesn't matter because that kid loves jazz and wants to be involved. And usually that kid's playing piano anyway, so, but it's, um, you find ways to make them work. You know what I'm saying? Um, instrumental class, we do ensembles during instrumental class where they have to get with their friends and do it all on their own and then play for the class. Of course, indoor groups is a, a wonderful way to keep things going. So just coming up with ways to involve them and you'll be shocked at how quickly they, they prove you right if it's a positive thing. Improvement. Okay, this is the number one for me part of this whole thing. And I'm gonna move fast enough so I'm not over time, but this is it. Everything we're talked about is, is fun and it's good, but first off, we need to teach them that it's okay to take a risk and fail. fail failing is positive, those are good things. And a lot of times I'll see kids fail and their immediate reaction is I'm quitting. Like we have to allow them to have a chance to fail without the mindset of quitting. Quitting shouldn't even be an option. But if they fail and then we react in a negative way to it, they're gonna wanna quit. So that's something I think we have to kind of continually um, adjust and monitor is how we react to failure for them. The power of being good is the most, power, is the most essential part of all of this, in my opinion. Because I don't care how much fun we're having, being bad is not fun. Not being good at something is not fun. And I always tell people there's two things on the earth that people spend a ton of money on that they're horrible at, golf and skiing. <laughs> Besides that, nothing else. Because it's not fun to be bad. And you may have great shirts and you got everybody moving equipment and all that, but if you're just not good, they're not going to enjoy themselves because that's kind of where your self-worth and that other part comes into play. So you owe it to them to make them better. Once again, it takes a village. I uh, went to our private lesson teacher for trumpet when I'm putting this next part together. And he's had the first and second chair trumpet here for 6A, five, six times. It's, it, the program he's put together is phenomenal. Like his first, he has the first and second chair trumpet in the top concert band today. So it's amazing what he's done. So I went to him and said, it's amazing what you've done. <laughs> Tell me what you're doing. So I used him to help me put this next part together. So effective curriculum, not only teaches them how to be better musicians, but I think also motivates them as learners. It makes them goal oriented and it makes them confident because you're giving them material and then putting the ownership into their hands. And these are the traits to me are more important than anything. You can go to med school off of this. You can go to law school off of this. You can go to engineering. You can do anything off of that. And that's, to me, what, the, what our biggest goal is. So just some highlights of what a curriculum, in my opinion, looks like. I won't talk on these. I'll, you can just read them, and I'll keep going. And then again, this is any instrument, period, to me. This doesn't matter that it has to be percussion or trumpet or whatever. And then also while I'm thinking about it while you're reading, I'm gonna upload a different set of handouts when we're done that actually has all of this in it. So the handout that I usually hand out in person, it makes you listen so you don't read it and walk out, because that's what I would do. But then I will upload the one that has all this already in it. So in case you didn't get one or if you want a different one. So curriculum, this is what fuels them, this is what allows them to achieve their goals, so let's jump into it. This is mine, but I also have the uh, percussion, the, sorry, trumpet one that we're gonna look at too. So how do we build a curriculum? You can do this on your own. You don't have to buy it. Um, but I, these are some things you'll have to take into account. 
You're going to be forced to make some decisions and stick to them. You can't write a curriculum and then change it five minutes later, and then five minutes later, and then five. You can't do that. So, what are building blocks? This is a question. For me, in percussion, I chose rhythm, chops, rudiments, mallets, drum set. Those are the building blocks I chose. The first question I get is, where's timpani? Well, rhythm, chops, mallet playing. Like, all the instruments are built in. It doesn't say snare drum up there. It doesn't say cymbals. Like, these are the foundational skills you need to be a percussionist. And then you apply them to everything else that's coming next. Okay, this is what he told me for trumpet that he builds his foundation off of. And then everything from here comes next. But this is his overarching philosophy. So then we talked about, okay, you gotta create thoughtful approaches so they understand the fundamentals. So a very easy fundamental, especially for percussion, is how are we gonna count? And I really wanted to clap, we have time to clap for this. Um, so I'm not saying one ando or one tete or whatever. I don't care, honestly, what you say. I know some people will literally throw down the gauntlet on what their words they're saying. I think that's really <laughs> silly. Um, as long as you're doing something and it works, then it's correct, is my opinion. I grew up one ando and I teach one tete So I, it doesn't matter to me. But how you use your counting is what I think is more important. So one thing we do, and this is what how I teach the beginners from day one, is we're gonna count everything we see on the page regardless of what it is. Nothing is treated differently. All Everything gets full emphasis. So if I was gonna clap this and count it, I'm gonna save everything, okay? And if you wanna follow, join me, then that'd be awesome. Here we go. So let's clap and say everything we see. One, two, ready, and. One, two, three, three, four, three, four, three, four, nine, two, three, la, three, four, three, la. So I set everything on the page, and that has its strengths and weaknesses. Then I'm, I say, okay, now only count what you're gonna hear coming off your instrument. Let's try that. Ready and go, and. One, take a, pay. Fourteen to one. Ali, pay one. Okay, that has its strengths, and obviously it has its weaknesses, but it's an appropriate way to count. Okay, another option is, we're only gonna count the downbeats. Or we're only gonna say left, right, if you're, if you're doing a marching band thing. Let's try that. Ready, and go, and. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Now notice that time between the quarter note and the triplet, that was the best space we had yet because we were vocalizing. Okay? And usually this is the time where I tell the low brass to stop counting with us. <laughs> but I won't do that today because we percussion, we got to have somebody, right, that we can make a joke about. So, but I'll move on. All right. And then subdividing. This is my favorite because I'll watch people rehearse. It'll be bad. They'll stop and go, subdivide. Here we go. And they start again. And it's like... <laughs> They don't know what they're doing. Why would they now know what they're doing? Just because you yelled the word, right? So I teach them, here's how we subdivide. Like, there's a system in place. So we count the bottom line, we play the top line. One, two, and red team, and then go, and. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, two, three, ten, four, two, ten, four, two, ten, two, ten, three, five, eight, four, two, three, four, two, three, And we teach them how to subdivide. I can't expect them to do any of that if I don't teach it to them. And that's in their curriculum. You want them to go home? Sorry, I forgot I put this in there. Tempo. We talk about how we're going to philosophically approach tempo. So we actually sit and talk through these things. Slow tempos are never the problem. They just exasperate what you're not doing right. That's why they hate playing slow. And they'll say, I can't play it this slow. It's, well, you can't play it. It's just more obvious right now. So that's why we use that concept of like, okay, what is really bad? That's going to be bad at real tempo. You just don't notice it as much, okay? We talk about if I'm playing slow, I think fast. If I'm playing fast, I think slow. And we do that concept a lot too. Um, so if I'm playing a real slow thing, then I'm going one, two, 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 two one, and I got to count fast. If it's really fast, I'm like one, two, three three, four, and I'm thinking slow. So we talk about that kind of stuff. Whoops. Um, then we talk about another thing with tempo, if I can get us back there, is cover the met. We talk about you're not gonna follow the met, 
you're going to cover the net because it's not telling you how to play in time. It's just a tool that you can check yourself against. So we talk about how to use a metronome, how to practice properly with a metronome covering the net or putting the net on quarter time, or whatever, net game as we call it. So we talk about how to work with a metronome. They won't do that if I don't teach it to them. We talk about, how, I'm gonna take, tell you to go home and learn your Allstate you know, A2s. Well, how? So in our curriculum, I have all the different ways I want you to learn music. Step by step, here's how I think you should do it. And then I'll demonstrate it, and it's all in there. So they follow their process of learning. We talk about how to blend with their ensemble, how to play dynamics. So I give them a chart that we use as a reference, and then this opens up conversation of, I'm playing a march, and it's me and a piccolo, and I'm on snare drum. And the composer put forte. It's like, well, okay, that's obviously not forte, that's triple piano, so how does that relate to whatever? So it gives us a chance to kind of have those conversations. I'll move fast here, this is just some random parts of our rhythm curriculum. You can see that like this is obviously works great for beginners, unless you tell your high school kids, hey, I want you to play upbeats on the right hand and play this with your left hand on your pad, and now it's the exact same thing and it takes on a whole new meaning. So it's, or that looks like a tambourine etude. It could be that, it could be whatever you want it to be. Um, same thing here, adding three note permutations. We add our two note permutations later on. We get into five lists and sevens and how five over three works. And all that. So you want your curriculum to be diverse enough to cover every kid you teach. You don't want to keep buying a new book every year. Like the parents are going to call you and ask you, what are you doing? So you want it to be as far reaching as possible. Um, it's on concepts, not exercises. So this is from my trumpet teacher. Fall semester, his four concepts. Spring semester, his four concepts. These are the concepts they're working on not the exercises they're working on. Same thing in percussion, um, except for, let's see, hold on, did I skip something? I'm trying to move fast, oh well. Um, here's some concepts in the percussion world. The grid, if you don't know what the grid is, it's like a never ending permutation based concept for drumming. So here's how it works, go work on it. I'll see you in 30 years, right? Here's um, <laughs> how to approach four mallets, permutations. What are they? How do they apply to what I'm doing? That's a concept, it's not a song. Here's how to break down rudiments. How do I break down what I'm playing into the smallest part and build it back up again? That's a concept. Here's how I develop independence. That's a concept, that's not an exercise. Um, also, it's expandable so they don't get bored. We have 13, sorry, 12 sticking systems at Keller that will approach. So I can take the exact same rhythm and have six different sticking systems going at once depending on what kind of player I have in the room. Like you can do that. You can, it doesn't have to be the same way every time. So it's, it's adaptable and it creates diversity. Here, we've got this exercise as written, there's not much to it. But then it says, go play in all major, minor keys and modes. Okay? So it just became expandable. And then the kid's gonna come back and go, what's a mode? Aha, uh -huh. now you have a whole new conversation. So again, it's expandable. Um, this is how we apply rhythm to drum set. I'll skip all that. If you really want to know about it, we can talk later when we're out of time. Um, it has to be relevant. So here's what our trumpet teacher says. He basically takes whatever they're being asked to do every day and teaches the opposite. So in marching band, you're playing above the staff. You're playing really loud. You're blowing your face off all day. He teaches everything the opposite of that in lessons. That's his curriculum. Then in the spring, when the second and third players aren't going above the staff ever, and it's not super technical, that's what he's working on. He's working on range and really fast technique. So he works opposite of what they're being asked to do to create a balance. Well, for percussion, we work along with the season, but we work hand in hand with it. So if it's the time of year where rudiments are really important, then we're gonna spend a lot of our curriculum work getting their rudiments going, okay? Or if I'm playing front ensemble marimba, I'm doing a lot of formality work. So we tend to follow what they're being asked to do instead of the opposite, okay? And it works great, I think, for both types of instruments. Um, here's relevancy, like a lot of us in the percussion world play things called like putters. Well then, we're gonna be working on putters at the end of the year. We're working on different flam exercises. We're working on advanced rudiments. 
Um, then I have a solo later in the you know, early spring or late fall I'm working on. Well, now I've got to go in and develop my one-handed rolls or my laterals or whatever. So it, it kind of goes along with the season for us. I want to make jazz band in the spring, so I need to jump to the back of the book and work on my grooves for the audition. Okay, usually that happens as I approach that season. It has to become part of the culture. This is a big thing for him and his trumpet players. Their culture is peer-to-peer -peer working relationships. They, do, they, they learn their curriculum together. It's a part of the group of trumpet players. The curriculum brings them together as their culture. So, top left corner, there's kids from different schools at, at McKellar, and that's their last night before they leave for Allstate. That's their last night of excerpts performing, and they play for each other. And you see there's a Keller Central kid, another school in our district there with them. And so that's them playing for each other. Down here, that's before school um, fundamentals practice. They all show before school, and they're not getting graded or paid or anything else, but they're coming in together, and they're doing full fundamental sectionals together. On the left, they're going to concerts. They're going to see great players. On the right, seniors playing for seventh graders and showing them how their solo should sound. And, and, th and helping them along the way um, because they're all part of the same curriculum. Here they are, three alumni came back um, and helped out with the trumpet players who were all preparing for Allstate and things like that. So it's like, here's a trumpet player in Juilliard right now. Here's a trumpet player in Indiana. They're gonna come back and play for you and help you in the same curriculum that they came through. So he brings them back and they help each other. Here's um, seventh and eighth graders working on the percussion curriculum, which is the same as these beginners, which is also the exact same as these high school kids that are working out of the same book and working on their skills for the marching band. So it's like the curriculum ties everything together. And so it becomes part of the culture. The next thing, in the, I like to have these type of sheets where not only do the beginners write down their assignments and stuff, you get used to that, but also, you know, there's like 600 lines in, in my book for writing an assignments. The, the point is, if a kid comes to you and is like, this chapel, I suck. It's like, okay, what, what are we talking about? Well, you know, my plan drags are horrible. It's like, okay, well, play them for me. And they play. Okay, see, they're horrible. I can't go any faster. It's like, well, let's go back and look at last year when you were playing them 20 beats slower than you are today. So you're fine. Keep doing what you're doing and get out of here. Because they can see their own progress. It's like, really, I was ever that short? How many of you ever said that when you look at pictures? Right? Or I was that young? Well, they can look at it and go, wow, I was really that slow? Like, I'm, I can play that easy now. So it's the idea of just letting them celebrate their own progress and at the same time being organized. All right, the last thing for curriculum, make it accessible. I'll go on Instagram and post a picture of something, and the first five likes are kids in the program. Right? They're not friends of mine anywhere. I mean, none of this is my personal stuff, but they can go see it. They can be a part of just the society or the, the culture that surrounds the, their own curriculum. Um, also, objective sheets, very powerful. This is the last thing under making them better musicians. We use objective sheets on every grade level in our feeder pattern, six through 12. And the power of the objective sheet, it guides their progress. It gives you a plan for grading, because we love that. So at least it allows you to lay it all out so you're done with it. I don't have to worry about what I'm grading the rest of the nine weeks or whatever. And it's an easy way to put the curriculum in there. So you're guiding them through the curriculum. It's already set up. Then they do their video and audio pass-offs. I do zero pass-offs in class. I, I don't ever allow that because it wastes time. So we work on waste. They have to be responsible enough to send the pass-off, not just wait for me to ask for it. And then, of course, the parents can look at it and say, why does my kid have a 40 right now in band? Well, get out their objective sheet and see how many they've passed off. Oh, never mind, thank you. So it lets them see what's going on. Here's a beginner objective sheet. I don't even know what year this was, but, so you see their pad assignments, you see pages out of the book, what line they're playing. You see um, counting for us is clapping and counting, that's how I teach rhythm. So all the different there, their mallet assignments, and here comes the winter concert, so they're working on the music. Like all of that is that six weeks. Everything they're doing in that six weeks, I hand them day one of the six weeks. And those kids that you didn't realize were gonna become the best player you've ever seen in your life will probably finish this in two weeks. And then you're like, huh, what do I got here? 
If you were handing them an assignment at a time, you would have never known that because you're making them go at your pace. Don't do that. Let them go at their pace and then see what happens. And you may not realize that, wow, you're going to be the next greatest thing I've ever had here. Okay, here's a JV high school percussion class. So we have two percussion classes. So they have some rhythm assignments. And they're older, I give them you know, harder tempos because it's like you can play that, but if it's not at 120, it doesn't count as being passed off. So we kind of do more tempo based. There's exercises down here. Um, and then that's kind of their, for that six weeks, that was their curriculum that they were, they were doing for me. Okay, and then this is pretty obvious. I won't get into all this, but just the idea of, you know, as we get older and things change more, it's easier to dismiss it, you know, back in my day kind of thing. Um, but we just have to accept it and move on, right? My daughter will watch YouTube way more than she'll watch a normal, and I still don't get it. My nine-year-old son will watch people playing video games. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> he will sit and watch other people play video games on YouTube. Like, so whatever, it is what it is. So we gotta reach them and find them in those places. Last thing I would tell you, um, and that is stay connected. Because if you want your kids to be motivated, improving, engaged, if you're not doing it, they're not doing it. And if you tell them, I'm going to San Antonio to take classes to be a better band director. Whoa, that's cool. Like, so you stay engaged, you stay involved, you stay improving, and they will mirror that. Okay. All right, thank you.